Aloha, everyone, and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, your host and president of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. As you know, Grassroot is always looking out, out for ways to manage and change our regulations that the government puts upon us so that we have an optimal environment for a good economy and for living life. Well, we often talk about zoning laws, and when we talk about zoning laws, we're usually talking about housing. But zoning laws cover a lot more than just housing. Today, we're going to talk about how they affect one kind of enterprise in particular. You might be surprised, beekeeping. My guest today is going to share with us information about the importance of beekeeping here in Hawaii, the scope and breadth of beekeeping business on the big island, and its national and even international significance. And we're also going to talk about how Hawaii County zoning regulations could be reformed or changed to help beekeepers have even more of an economic impact and social impact than they already do. So would you please welcome to our program today, Harry Hull. Harry is president of the Big Island Beekeeping Association. Harry, welcome to the program. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you for having me. And you're there in Hilo right now. Correct. Well, what a beautiful place to be doing business and to be living and so forth. How long have you lived on the Big Island? Um, coming on 10 years now. Well, you are the president of the Big Island Beekeeping Association. Can you tell our viewers just a little bit about that group, how it got started and what its mission is? <clears throat> well, it, um, the, actually the organization, the association got started in around 1984. Um, with just a group of uh, beekeepers basically getting together every once in a while just to talk story. Um, and that's the way it was for quite some time. Um, about uh, 12, uh, 13 years ago, um, we actually started to get a little bit more like organized. We opened up a teaching apiary and where we invited the public in uh, two Saturdays a month. So if you were interested in beekeeping or just a beginning beekeeper and you wanted to get some information, um, then um, you had a place to, to come and actually get hands-on. Interesting. We are, yeah, we're also uh, very big in education. Uh, we give talks um, to anybody who wants to hear about bees. We do talks at libraries and schools. Um, and Every year, we host the um, a uh, the Hawaiian Honey Challenge, ah. and it's a challenge for all beekeepers throughout the entire state, um, where they can kind of compete. Um, we have two sets of judging. We have a formal judging that's not open to the public, and then we have on the first Friday in November in Hilo, which is uh, Black and White Night. Um, we have a public tasting, and members of the public can come, taste the honey, pick their favorite, and and then, you know, the winners are announced, and it's basically bragging rights uh, for the beekeepers. They also get awards. Um, but the big thing for us is to expose uh, the public to locally raw honey. Uh, Other. Most people just know the honey that they see in the, at the store, um, but aren't familiar. And they think that, you know, honey tastes the same when it definitely does not. Well, Harry, it, yeah. tell me, what, what is the difference between the kind of honey you might pick up when you go into a grocery store, uh, maybe a national chain, a national brand, versus this raw honey that you're talking about that is grown here in Hawaii and on the Big Island? What are the right. well, the differences are really huge uh, because first the honey that's brought in um, in the big chains and, and things they're all blended honey. Um, the companies want to make sure that the color is always the same and the taste is always the same. Um, unfortunately, um, you don't really know if you're getting real honey and it's not altered. Um, and with locally. Uh, produced honey, you get the wide variety um, of of flavors. Um, you know, you have mac nut. It's going to taste a little bit different than from citrus or avocado or lychee. 
Um, and in some cases, the flavors, depending on the combination of flowers, uh, nectar in those flowers, uh, tastes can range from neutral little to coffee to we've had one that people have said tasted like cherry cola, oh, a, a maple bacon, um, no, no. and just a variety. Um, when we do the, the public tasting, we have them all lined up, uh, and we separate them by colors, light, medium, and dark. And people assume because they see a table full of light honey that they're all going to be the same. And they're right. absolutely shocked when they start tasting it, and none of them taste the same. How about that? Now, Harry, I've just learned something, because I'm not a honey connoisseur. Well, not yet, but I have to <laughs> say this is indeed the sweetest program that I've had uh, on air, and... <laughs> Maybe I'll come over and visit your honey competition. Now, now, just tell us a little bit about your own background. I assume you are a beekeeper. Yes. Yeah. How, I how actually did you get involved in the craft. Well, I got involved in the craft um, about, I would say, about eight uh, years ago. Um, I was um, living on a farm, and the owner of the property had a hive. Somebody else was taking care of it. And... They, I'm not sure what happened to them if they left the island or, um, I don't really recall, but here's a hive that the owner didn't want to deal with because he was kind of afraid of bees, and I volunteered to, to do that. Um, so I, you know, reading a lot and, you know, watching a lot of YouTube videos, um, I also benefited from being with, I mean, going to the public um, uh, learning apiary from the Big Island Beekeepers Association. So I attended some meetings and I basically joined up and, you know, been working with bees and Biba since then. Well, how about that? Now, I understand that Hawaii plays an inordinately large role in supplying queen bees throughout the world. In particular, uh, we supply, as you shared with us earlier, about a quarter of all be uh, queen bees that, that are sent to Canada, and uh, about no, I'm sorry, actually more than that, Canada about three fourths. Yeah, and well, about actually a of the United States. Tell tell me about it. Yes, actually, actually those numbers are a little different now. You okay. can't <laughs> excuse me. Um, we used to supply about twenty five percent of queens to the mainland. Uh, now it's closer to thirty thirty five percent. Um, which. If you think about what bees pollinate, almonds, all sorts of berries, um, uh, oranges in Florida, for example, um, you're looking at a, at a multi-billion dollar um, for agriculture on the mainland. Here in, in Hawaii, it represents approximately $220 million worth of agriculture. Um, and so... They're kind of like our silent heroes. Um, one of the advantages we have here on the Big Island is we have no winter. And so we can produce all year round. And so with the massive die-offs on the mainland, uh, which um, has been around 40%, um, they can't afford to take the time to grow queens and then wait for workers and for them to go out, they want to hit the ground running, and that's why they purchase queens from us. Canada is closer to 75% of wow. uh, their queens from us. I don't know what the dollar value impact for Canadian agriculture is, but um, I've, I've heard, and if you just think about the various um, fruits and vegetables that uh, uh, bees pollinate, and you think a third of that comes is due because of the Big Island. Uh, and also, it represents, in, on, on the Big Island, it represents a little over you know, $10 million in revenue and employment of a little over 70 people. Well, I didn't know that Hawaii played such a significant role in the worldwide market for queen bees. But let me ask you a, a, a little bit more specific question. Sure. Are queen bees the main product that Hawaii Island beekeepers sell? Or, or do they also sell honey, and uh, which, which do they sell more? Well, it, it, um, we do sell honey, um, 
Honey Sales, uh, the stats from a few years ago, was a little bit over $3 million. Um, I believe it was like 3.2 or $3.3 million in just honey. Um, we also sell uh, honey, I mean, bee products like wax, uh, propolis. And, you know, it's used for, you know, a whole line of, you know, candles and cosmetics and pharmaceuticals use them. Um, so there's a whole thing behind not just honey. And most people don't know that. Um, as a matter of fact, there's some, uh, uh, for example, there is a wax that's uh, made from honey, mostly that's used for board wax on surfboards. Um, and it just goes on and on. Amazing. Now, uh, we wanted to talk with you because of the potential economic impact of making things easier on our producers of queen bees and uh, the honey growers and so forth. Here, right. it's yeah, the water. It's, it's uh, uh, yeah, it's not only you know the queen bees are obviously the 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 top um, and really an important industry. One of the things that you need to keep in mind is that we cannot import bees to Hawaii. Um, the only thing we can bring in uh, to Hawaii is bee semen. Um, and, but we cannot bring any bees in. Um, it's strictly controlled for the very simple reason we don't have Africanized bees here in the state, and we definitely don't want them, because if we ever got um, Africanized bees, industry would be destroyed. Okay. So that's not the way to go to increase the industry output. But there is a proposal that you have before the legislature now in this session. It's Bill 44. And that Correct. would help the beekeepers in your industry to yes to the industry. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that and in particular how changing the zoning laws a bit can make a real difference in terms of our productivity for beekeepers. Well, to start off with <clears throat> Um, the current law is that in the past, and nowadays no one knows exactly how or why it happened, but that's now irrelevant. Um, uh, Bayperies got put into, uh, they were lumped in with uh, cows and pigs. And with piggeries, you, were, you, you can't have them 1,000 feet from a major roadway. The problem is major roadway is not defined in the legislation. Um, there was a queen breeder on the Kona side um, that was forced to move his entire operation because his bees were nine, about 980 feet from the roadway. Um, and at that time, they determined that any road that's an egress to a property can be considered a major roadway. So that was a major, major problem. There's a lot of farms that, that on ag land that cannot keep bees because of that. Um, you've got a lot of stretches of property that might be many, many acres, but if they're long and narrow and you have a road on one side and a road on the other side, you might not be able to have any bees there. The other problem was if you look at the animal uh, section, that they classified bees as pets, and there it's 75 feet. So... What are they? And just as a side note, honey is actually classified as a specialty crop by the USDA. Um, so that's a problem. People who have uh, backyard beekeepers, for example, technically are not legally allowed to because that's residential. Um, and we've got many, many, I can't tell you how many people have reached out, I mean, reached out to us and told us, you know, I've got this avocado tree or I've got this citrus tree and it like doesn't produce. And hey, I found out, you know, my neighbor is, uh, you know, put a hive in and now my trees are blowing up. So what we wanted to do is make sure that beekeepers can be beekeepers regardless of what the zoning is. So this bill removes apiaries from all zoning. Uh. So, so if you have a building in downtown Hilo and you want to put a roof garden on top, you could have a hive in your garden on your rooftop. Currently, you cannot. And so that's why it's, it's kind of important. It's important that 
we keep genetics. It's important that we be that we keep um, our own bees healthy. Um, we lost about thirty-five to forty percent of our bees, um, and when when they had the Leilani um, eruption, and we lost about thirty, I believe they're like thirty-eight hundred acres of vegetation. So it's uh, resources for bees, and we also lost a lot of bees. Uh, well, you know, so your analysis of the zoning regulations that apply to bees. Uh, and the beekeepers is fascinating uh, because well, a lot of zoning regulations are, are just uh, difficult to understand. But the story you're telling uh, tells us that it, the zoning regulations may have made sense at one time, but definitely need to be revised. How about in counties? How how do they regulate this uh, outside of the Big Island and as well across the United States and Canada? Well, I'll give you an example. And one of the, I mean, this whole thing started with one of our members, who's actually one of the board members at the time, that was forced to have his hive removed because a neighbor across the street was complaining. Um, he was just a problem neighbor. It was had nothing to do because two houses down from him, that person had two hives, and that was fine. Um, and he was forced to 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 move his hives. When when we started looking into this, uh, we were quite shocked uh, that, for example, in San Francisco that has you know, small lots, uh, densely populated, has no regulation. You can have hives anywhere you want, and as, and as many as can, can, can be supported by the local vegetation. Um, you can have hives in Manhattan. You can have hives in L.A., but you can't have hives in Hilo. That made no sense to me at all and to our organization. So we started this whole thing about let's look into this. Um, some um, have regulations regarding the size of lots. Others have no regulations as, so as far as sizes of lots um, or how many you can have. Um, some states have actual um, bee inspectors that come out and they're very pro beekeepers. And, you know, they, they try to match you with mentors or organizations that can, can help out. Well, how do you actually transport your products to Canada and the mainland? Uh, through the mail? Through Yes, through the mail. For FedEx? And, and tell me, what, what are the regulations uh, locally and internationally even regarding the transport? Well, um, we have, I mean, they are shipped from, from here, <clears throat> uh, mostly by um, you, you know, U.S. mail. Um, I'm not sure if they do FedEx, um, but uh, they're, you know, they're live. They're in uh, a special... Uh, like container, um, and there's a queen, and there's some small bees in there. They're the queen's attendants um, that uh, uh, go with them, um, and it's just it's it's similar to how we ship, you know, chickens and and other live animals. Now, what about beekeepers who want to sell some of their honeys at farmers markets or yes. stores? Are are there any County or state regulations that make it more. There's all. Be. Well, no, actually, no. There really isn't. The there are state regulations in regards to labeling. Uh, there's certain things that you're required to put on the label, um, and that's really it. Um, <clears throat> and as far as um, a, you know, you only need to have like a certified processing if you're doing more than 500 gallons a year. Uh, but the great majority of people. Don't reach that, especially the smaller producers. Um, a, a lot of them sell at farmers markets, roadside stands, um, and so some you know sell online. Um, and and a lot of those people, small businesses. I mean, they're not going to make a lot of money, but you know they make enough money to to pay a bill or two. You know, buy you know kids' uh, school supplies and so on. So one of the goal was if if we are able to bring in where we eliminate zoning, then all these people are, will be in compliance. And all right. that's really in, in important. The other thing to understand that a beehive can be on ag land. <clears throat> the bee can travel anywhere from up to three to five miles from their hive to forage. So 
it has no idea what zone it's going to go to or from. <laughs> and so you can have a hive in one place and it can be foraging in a residential area. Um, so it can forage in a residential area, but the place that it forages can't have a bee there, beekeeper there, All right. which, you know, again, makes, makes no sense. And so that was one of the things that, that we did um, to placate some of the, the rules uh, and stuff. Uh, we came down to, we negotiated down to, um, you can have a hive up to 25 feet from the property line or 15 feet if you have a flyover barrier. Um, and, and that's basically it. Um, we were working with a working group um, to go through this, and it was mostly uh, a bunch of beekeepers from hobbyists to commercial to uh, queen breeders. We also had, um, obviously, um, Ashley Kirkowitz was leading the, um, um, it, the our uh, council member, and we had people from um, the state health department. We had local ag department planning, uh, corporate council. So, so we brought all these people in, the potential stakeholders, they kind of really go through this. We didn't want to make the same mistake that was made, you know, decades ago where they just going to just throw something out there or have, okay, you want a residential, then fine, we'll just do one bill for residential and exclude everyone else. So well, Harry, I thought that was unfair. You, you've worked very hard on this. And uh, with respect to Bill 144, have you received any pushback? And uh, what are your responses to those who may have... Well, we, we haven't really received any pushbacks um, directly. There was just a lot of questions um, about, um, you know, what happens, you know, if, um, you know, I have a problem and, you know, who can I go to? And it's, and it's, it's spelled out in, in the bill. Um, one of the things also that is, is important to, to note, part of the bill is, uh, best practice, and it's it's kind of an industry known. And if you follow the best practices, you know you're really not going to have an issue. If you communicate with your neighbors, you're not going to have an issue. Um, you know, there's there's little things in in the best practice. Have a water supply there so the bees don't travel to the neighbor's pool or something like that. Um, you know, in order not to confuse the bees, don't have you know like your porch light on at night. You know, close to your hive. You know, a lot of little things like that that. Um, our best practice, but also common sense. Perry, what would you say the future of your industry is here in Hawaii, and um, how easily could people get involved in that? Well, they can easily get involved if 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 they really are you know interested in it. Um, the uh, the investment is minimal, um, but uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and. You don't have to learn a lot. Um, I, you know, if you're really interested, you should um, find a local be an organization, club, association, um, or find a local beekeeper and you know for p potential mentoring. Um, and and yes, most people you know are might be interested in like one or two hives. They're, they're not interested in, in more hives because you know they don't want another job, and and that's really understandable. Well, I have to tell you. Very proud of you and your colleagues who are standing up to fight for the right to actually make a living and to build an economy here in Hawaii. It's an important thing you do, and uh, as I pointed out earlier, I'm just amazed at the, the the role that the Hawaii beekeeping industry plays globally. And this is something that we should actually be very proud of, and something we should actually be expanding. So uh, I oh, wish absolutely. you absolutely on Bill 144. What do the prospects look like in this legislative session? Well, they, they look pretty good. I mean, it went through the first committee, um, and now it's in the hands of planning. Um, they're going to review it and come back with comments. I can't see them having any real comments since they were part of the working group. Um, so it's going to come back to uh, back to the, the legislative group, and then um, if there's really no change, it's going to go to the full council. Um, and hopefully, um, there's going to be one reading on the Hilo side, one reading on the Kona side, and hopefully, you know, by within the next, you know, five, maybe six months, you know, it'll be passed. Um, well, yeah, assuming the letter will pass it, sign it. I've got a quick question before you leave today. Yes. What have you and the Big Island Beekeeping Association members learned about politics 
in, in <laughs> an adventure of trying to defend yes. your, your business? What have you learned? Quite a bit. Um, we we were never, you know, uh, we would never have never been involved in anything like this. And so we've learned a lot about, you know, mostly negotiations from different departments. Um, at times it has been frustrating because you're dealing with uh, non beekeepers or people that have no knowledge of bees and don't realize the impact. Uh, we've talked about, you know, we have talked about, you know, the global effect from, from bees here. Um, one thing that's not really mentioned too much is food security within our own islands. Um, and that's why it's another thing to, to, um, uh, to keep in mind. It's really important to have bees. Whether you're just a one high backyard beekeeper is almost just as, part, as important as the big commercial guys. Terrific. Well, Harry, thank you so much for all you're doing, and I want to wish you the very best. Thank you for being on the program today. Rip. Sure. Thank you very much, and I do appreciate the opportunity to be here. Mahalo. Well, well, everyone, my guest today has been Harry Hall, president of the Big Island Beekeeping Association. And what a delightful conversation this has been. I hope you've learned something. I certainly have, and it, it has been indeed a sweet program. I'm Kelihi Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. You've been watching uh, Hawaii Together on Think Tech Hawaii. Until next time, aloha. 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 We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.